It is the 17th of May 1979 and the government is deciding to close down a nuclear reactor. It's not particularly old, having only been in operation for a little under a decade. It was certainly not cheap, so throwing away an insane amount of investment was not a decision made on a whim. But much like a car with a blown engine, sometimes it's better to just cut your losses. And this is exactly the case with Bonitia A1 in the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. In just a few short years, the reactor had proven to be a disaster, with two operators losing their lives and two major reactor incidents within just two years. As such, closing the place down is not such an unreasonable reaction. The latter of the two events would be rated on the INES scale of a 4, putting it in line with such events as the Tokaimura nuclear accident, the Lucian's reactor meltdown and the famous SL1 disaster. But unlike those, our ones today were just not mentioned to the public, thus got largely forgotten to time. Today we're looking at the 1976 and 1977 Yezlovsky bonusia nuclear power plant incidents. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon and YouTube members. If you want to watch my videos early access and ad free then please do check it out. nuclear state. Our story begins in the 1950s. The Cold War between East and West is well underway. Europe has been divided. One country which has found itself under the communist banner was that of Czechoslovakia. The country in 1948 had experienced a USSR-backed coup. The country proved to be a little nice addition to the Soviet sphere of influence. It bordered West Germany and, vital for our story, had a large number of uranium deposits, as said in Nuclear Energy in Czechoslovakia, an outline and description of its development trends. Czechoslovakia was well stocked with uranium, whose deposits were 6 to 20 times larger than the world average. Uranium had been regularly shipped to the USSR from the late 1940s, Understandable, as it would make a portion of the uranium used in the Soviet Union's first atomic bomb. As part of the country's first five-year plan post-communist takeover, a document was drawn up, called the General Plan for the Development of Energy, in which it was agreed that a significant increase in power generation in the country was required to reach its economic and production targets. To meet the demand, multiple coal generation stations were built, but after the 1954 opening of the USSR's first nuclear reactor in Obinsk, energy courses would change for the CSSR. In 1954, the USSR began to offer assistance to the various states under its sphere of influence, and this was for the research and use of nuclear energy. The CSSR would enter a deal with the USSR on the 25th of April 1955 to share nuclear information. This was followed in March 1956 with another agreement, which allowed, in July and August of the same year, the first group of Czechoslovak designers and constructors together with Soviet experts to begin to plan a new and exciting reactor for Czechoslovakia, which ultimately led to the commencement of the construction of A1 in Jaslovetsky Bonesia, based in western modern-day Slovakia in 1958. The new reactor, which would be built entirely in the country by Skoda Works, yes, that Skoda, albeit to Soviet plans. However, construction would be mired with economic and technical issues, which would drag out the completion of A1 until 1972, 16 years from start to finish. The reactor was designed to be fueled by unenriched uranium mined within the country, and when at full electricity production capacity, it had a nameplate of around 150 megawatts. This was from three turbine generators with a stated power of 50 megawatts each. The electricity was then squirted into the 220 kilovolt electric network. But let's have a look at how the reactor worked. The A1 reactor was a gaseous CO2 cooled heavy water moderated system. The reactor core was within a pressure vessel made up of 15 centimeter thick carbon steel in a cylindrical shape with a diameter of 5.1 meters and a height of 20 meters. Surrounding this whole arrangement was a water tank forming the biological protection. 
The reactor produced power by heating up the coolant CO2 gas. It exited the pressure vessel via pipework at a temperature of around 420 degrees centigrade, aided by a turbo compressor, which then made its way to six steam generators, which then pushed the turbines which created the tasty electricity. The core had technical channels in which the fuel rods could be inserted. The system's fuel rods were made up from 70 metal uranium wires, each clad in a compound of magnesium and beryllium bundled together. The reactor was placed within the reactor building in which top the biological shield. This was the floor with a large open building above it called the hall. The hall housed a refueling machine. This arrangement allowed operators to walk around in the hall without the fear of getting a little bit glowy. Fuel was delivered in the form of uranium rods via rail in special containers. After arriving, it was assembled inside a designated area workshop near the hall. The design of the reactor allowed fuel changes to be undertaken whilst it was still in operation. This is a great feature as it stops downtime, but the whole reusing crack would turn out to be a bit of a thorn in the reactor's side. The Disasters 1976 So today is a bit of a double disaster special, the first of which brings us to 1976 and the need to refuel the A1 reactor. It is January the 5th 1976 and the reactor is in cooling down mode after a fault has been discovered along the 220 kilovolt power network. The blackout occurred on January the 4th 1976 and this was from a nearby substation. The reactor during this incident had been scrammed, that is, having the control rod shoved into the reactor core, shutting it down safely. A fuel rod in channel H05 was planned to be replaced. It had reached the end of its useful life. In order to replace the fuel, the refueling machine was moved across the reactor hall and placed over the technical channel. The refueling machine was then connected to the technical channel, in doing so matching the pressure within the reactor. The spent fuel rod was extracted from the core into the refueling machine, in which afterwards the tightness of the plug at the top of the reactor was checked. The spent fuel was then moved off to the spent fuel area and this was at around 11.55 in the morning. The refueling machine then went to insert a new rod. After apparently being sealed, which was indicated to operators by an electrical indication, the refueling machine began to lift away as per the operating instructions. In an instant at around 11.57 a.m., the fuel rod shot out of the reactor multiple meters into the air of the reactor hall. The shift engineer at 11.58 am raised the alarm and called the workers in the reactor room to leave. There was also a dosimetric signaling of exceeding the permitted values of air contamination. CO2 analyzers showed an increased concentration in the air and the hissing of coolant alerted workers nearby to the deadly gas that was now spewing out into the hall. With the reactor now losing coolant at a rate of 70 kilograms a second, the unit was in a very real possibility of overheating, leading to a radiological disaster. The heat in the core was rapidly rising, and due to the reactor being shut down from the earlier power grid blackout, not enough electricity was available to pump the coolant. The site's diesel generators started up to push the coolant through the core, however some of the turbo compressors failed to start thus stopping the flow of the coolant. If the technical channel couldn't be closed, within half an hour of the initial leak, potentially all of the gas could have escaped from the core, leaving no chance for the reactor to cool down. After entering the hall in protective gear, an operator managed to move the smashed up fuel rod and was able to manually seal off channel H04, with the help of the refueling machine sealing off the leak. At 1.04pm, the compressor finally succeeded in reaching the required speed to cool the core. If a meltdown had occurred, then well, a lot of people would have known about it. But no one was irradiated and no radiation was released. All the people within the reactor hall had escaped. However, two men in an adjacent building were suffocated by the release of the coolant. They hadn't heard the emergency alarms. Surprisingly, there wasn't massive amounts of damage to the reactor from the incident. The cause was not completely understood, however steps were taken to avoid the event from happening again. One such was stopping H05 from being used for fuel and adding extra checks during refueling for channel plug seals. The reactor was brought back online after the repairs, but disaster would strike almost exactly a year later. 1977 Our next disaster kicked off on the 22nd of February 1977. 
with the planned replacement of a spent fuel cell in the reactor in technological channel C05. The exchange was to take place in the afternoon, and as usual, whilst the reactor was operating. It was producing at the time a power output of 93 megawatts. The new fuel rod slid into the reactor and all seemed well. However, shortly after, the operators noticed an increase in temperature in channel C05. The heat damaged the channel to the point that it melted the wall between it and the heavy water moderator. On top of this, the surrounding technological channels also began to experience damage. The heavy water began to penetrate into the gas part of the primary circuit. This meant that the reactor was now running in a dangerous scenario. The separation between the moderator and coolant was now compromised and the heat continued to rise. Radiation was released into the reactor hall. Quickly, the reactor was scrammed, shutting it down, but the damage was done. Both primary and secondary cooling circuits had been damaged, as well as multiple technical channels. Monitoring of the radiation released found that the leakage into the environment was not significant. Apparently, that's what they said at the time. But how did the fuel heat up from a random to a relatively normal refueling routine? Well, unlike the first incident, this time it was down to operator error. You see, during fuel transport, silica gel is placed amongst it to stop moisture building up. Much like when you buy any electrical item, workers, when unpacking the fuel ready to be put into the fuel rod, were meant to remove and discard the silica gel. However, during this, a bag was torn and the silica gel partially inside the fuel cell. The assembly workers managed to partially remove the grains of silica gel with tweezers and a vacuum cleaner, but not every part was collected. They did not record the incident, thus no one knew the potential risk of the mislaid gel. When the fuel cell was inserted into the reactor core, the gel reduced some of the flow of the coolant, thus allowing the core to overheat. Although the reactor was shut down, over the next two days, the discharges from the ventilation stack were up to three times greater than the daily limits. Even worse, in the first week after the event, the activity of discharged wastewater exceeded the allowable amounts by up to 5,000 times into the Duva River. But such a small mistake had long-reaching ramifications, not just for the environment, but the reactor as a whole. The aftermath. Faced with a massive bill for repair, the CSSR decided maybe it would be best to cut their losses and shut the whole job down and decommission the A1. The reactor had been nothing but trouble, and the two major events were the last two very big nails in the coffin. Plus, it would turn out to be easier to install Soviet VVER reactors. They boasted a power output much higher than the A1, and with the wealth of knowledge from the USSR, they would be cheaper to operate. Over its short life, it worked for 19,261 hours, generating 916 gigawatt hours of electricity. Decommissioning would take, well, it's still being undertaken right now, and during the 1990s, the fuel was exported to Russia for disposal. But although shut down, the plant has left its mark on the environment. As stated in Wild Plant Species in Bio Indication of Radioactive Contamination Sites around the Yazlovsky Bonosia nuclear power plant in the Slovak Republic. The 19 km long banks of the NPP wastewater recipient have been identified as contaminated by cesium-137. In total, more than 67,000 cubic metres of riverbanks have been found to be contaminated at levels exceeding 1 becquerel of cesium-137. This was back in 2007. But as we know from other videos, cleanups are a long and arduous task. So it's time for my scale. It's going to be a 2. Although the 1977 event got the INES scale number of 4. And this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know below. This is a Plain Default production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Like License. Plain Default videos are produced by me, John, in the currently mild corner of Southern London, UK. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching and Mr. Music, play us out please.